Hi there, welcome or welcome back to our channel. In this video, we're going to do a full Cambridge Advanced Listening Test from start to finish. We're going to cover all the instructions and the tasks themselves so you know exactly what to expect on exam day. And at the end of the video, we're going to give you the answer key and show you how to convert your score onto the Cambridge exam scale. And this is actually quite tricky, so we're going to help you to see if you're at B2, C1 or C2 level. That is really important information for you to have, so you do not want to miss that. And you can also find links to extra resources in the description box below. So if you're preparing for the Cambridge Advanced Exam, or you just want to know more about it and find out if you are at the level, then I highly suggest that you subscribe to Home Studies. So before we get going with the listening test, let's just establish some of the basics. The full listening test takes about 40 minutes. And in that time, you do four parts, each of which have a different skill focus. You listen to each of the recordings twice. And you have to write all of your answers on a separate answer sheet. So as you listen, you can just write your answers on the question paper. But then you have five minutes at the end of the test to transfer your finalized answers to the answer sheet. You get one mark for each correct answer, and there are 30 marks available in total. Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. You will now have 15 seconds to look at extract one. Extract one. You will hear two friends talking. Now look at questions one and two. How did your riding weekend with Annie go, Karen? Well, it was a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. My riding's a bit shaky, to say the least, and it had been years since I'd been on a horse. But I thought it would be worth it to do a bit of mother-daughter bonding. Annie is quite proficient on a horse, isn't she? Yes. Well, she's had a lot of lessons with a good friend of mine who is an instructor. In fact, I should have had a few myself before going on the weekend trip. By the time we arrived at the stables, I was beginning to doubt whether the whole thing was a good idea. Annie had been happily telling me horror stories of riding accidents that she knew about, but I thought I'd got that far and I'd stick with it. Unfortunately, I was worse than I thought, and I've really felt like the class dunce. I spent the whole weekend with a group of seven-year-olds, while Annie had a whale of a time in the adult group. So much for our bonding weekend. Now you will hear the recording again. How did your riding weekend with Annie go, Karen? Well, it was a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. My riding's a bit shaky, to say the least, and it had been years since I'd been on a horse. But I thought it would be worth it to do a bit of mother-daughter bonding. Annie is quite proficient on a horse, isn't she? Yes. Well, she's had a lot of lessons with a good friend of mine who is an instructor. In fact, I should have had a few myself before going on the weekend trip. By the time we arrived at the stables, I was beginning to doubt whether the whole thing was a good idea. Annie had been happily telling me horror stories of riding accidents that she knew about, but I thought I'd got that far and I'd stick with it. Unfortunately, I was worse than I thought, and I've really felt like the class dunce. I spent the whole weekend with a group of seven-year-olds, while Annie had a whale of a time in the adult group. So much for our bonding weekend. You will now have 15 seconds to look at extract two. Extract one. 
Extract 2 You will hear part of an interview with an actor about how he tries to keep fit. Now look at questions 3 and 4. Now, Bob, you lead a hectic life. How do you keep on top of everything without getting too run down? Well, I have to make a real effort to keep in reasonable shape, because I do have a lot of work on. If you aren't fairly fit, it affects everything you do. <laughs> I hate jogging, especially as it rains so much in this country, and I'd miss so many mornings by hiding in bed instead of getting up for a run. So I go to the gym. It's not my favourite pastime, but it's a necessary evil. So have you joined half of the population by making a New Year's resolution to keep fit? I don't really believe in New Year resolutions myself, but anything that spurs people on to improve their life in some way has to be a good thing. It would be good if more people gave themselves a fighting chance, though, and didn't give up so easily. Now you will hear the recording again. Now, Bob... You lead a hectic life. How do you keep on top of everything without getting too run down? Well, I have to make a real effort to keep in reasonable shape, because I do have a lot of work on. If you aren't fairly fit, it affects everything you do. <laughs> I hate jogging, especially as it rains so much in this country, and I'd miss so many mornings by hiding in bed instead of getting up for a run. So I go to the gym. It's not my favourite pastime, but it's a necessary evil. So have you joined half of the population by making a New Year's resolution to keep fit? I don't really believe in New Year resolutions myself, but anything that spurs people on to improve their life in some way has to be a good thing. It would be good if more people gave themselves a fighting chance, though, and didn't give up so easily. You will now have 15 seconds to look at Extract 3. Extract 3 You will hear two people talking about a new activity they have taken up. Now look at questions 5 and 6. Hi George, how did the skating go? Well, you know I decided to take little Susan skating because I'd found my old skates while I was clearing out the loft. We hired a pair for Susan to wear, and I was dying to see if I still had what it takes. Actually, although I say so myself, I was quite good. Well, I went to my first line dancing class on Saturday, and it was great fun. I'd expected a lot of people to be wearing cowboy hats, and of course it was nothing like that. The music was a bit old-fashioned, but boy, it was hard work. I really worked up a sweat. I'll definitely keep it up. Now you will hear the recording again. Hi, George. How did the skating go? Well, you know I decided to take little Susan skating because I'd found my old skates while I was clearing out the loft. We hired a pair for Susan to wear, and I was dying to see if I still had what it takes. Actually, although I say so myself, I was quite good. Well, I went to my first line dancing class on Saturday and it was great fun. I'd expected a lot of people to be wearing cowboy hats and of course it was nothing like that. The music was a bit old-fashioned, but boy, it was hard work. I really worked up a sweat. I'll definitely keep it up. That's the end of part one. Part 2. You will hear a radio report about panic attacks. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You will now have 45 seconds to look at part 2.
Panic attacks are the subconscious mind's fight or flight response to what it perceives to be a threatening situation. It's common for people to experience their first panic attack following periods of high stress. Initially, you seem to have coped well with the situation, and then suddenly, often months later, you have an attack. The first physical sign is usually heart palpitations. Most people feel that they're not getting enough air, so they gasp, hyperventilate, or in other words, overbreathe. Other symptoms include tingling in the hands and feet, chest pain, sweating, faintness, and stomach pains. Each person has their own symptoms, which usually remain the same. There are, however, things you can do to stop or reduce the impact of a panic attack. It's worth buying a diary so that you can record any negative thoughts you have about a situation before it happens. Then challenge them by considering how accurate they are. Set about turning them into positive, constructive thoughts. If you do have an attack, stay where you are, so your mind gets the message that the place isn't really threatening. Although your immediate anxiety will decrease if you run away, this might lead to increased anxiety in the future. So it's the worst thing you can do. You need to learn to relax. Active relaxation involves tensing for a few seconds and then relaxing. In turn, every muscle that you can think of in your body, usually starting from the face, scalp, and neck, and moving down to the feet. Using this relaxation technique at night can also aid sleep. An attack can be treated very simply by breathing in and out with a paper bag held to your mouth. This helps reduce your loss of carbon dioxide as you re-inhale the carbon dioxide you've exhaled. Holding your breath for as long as possible can also help prevent loss of carbon dioxide. If you can hold your breath for between 10 and 15 seconds and repeat this a few times, it'll be sufficient to calm hyperventilation. In the long term. You can lower your stress levels and stop the likelihood of panic attacks by learning deep, diaphragmatic breathing. If you practice this regularly, several times a day, your body will have no choice but to relax. Finally, try a natural remedy such as chamomile tea, which works on the same brain receptors as anti-anxiety drugs, or the herb valerian or aconite, which can ease the effects of acute panic attacks. Now you will hear part two again. Panic attacks are the subconscious mind's fight or flight response to what it perceives to be a threatening situation. It's common for people to experience their first panic attack following periods of high stress. Initially, you seem to have coped well with the situation, and then suddenly, often months later, you have an attack. The first physical sign is usually heart palpitations. Most people feel that they're not getting enough air, so they gasp, hyperventilate, or in other words, overbreathe. Other symptoms include tingling in the hands and feet, chest pain, sweating, faintness, and stomach pains. Each person has their own symptoms, which usually remain the same. There are, however, things you can do to stop or reduce the impact of a panic attack. It's worth buying a diary. So that you can record any negative thoughts you have about a situation before it happens, then challenge them by considering how accurate they are. Set about turning them into positive, constructive thoughts. If you do have an attack, stay where you are, so your mind gets the message that the place isn't really threatening. Although your immediate anxiety will decrease if you run away, this might lead to increased anxiety in the future. So it's the worst thing you can do. You need to learn to relax. Active relaxation involves tensing for a few seconds and then relaxing. In turn, every muscle that you can think of in your body, usually starting from the face, scalp, and neck, and moving down to the feet. Using this relaxation technique at night can also aid sleep. An attack can be treated very simply by breathing in and out with a paper bag held to your mouth. This helps to reduce your loss of carbon dioxide. As you re-inhale the carbon dioxide you've exhaled, holding your breath for as long as possible can also help prevent loss of carbon dioxide. If you can hold your breath for between 10 and 15 seconds and repeat this a few times, it'll be sufficient to calm hyperventilation. In the long term, 
You can lower your stress levels and stop the likelihood of panic attacks by learning deep, diaphragmatic breathing. If you practice this regularly, several times a day, your body will have no choice but to relax. Finally, try a natural remedy, such as chamomile tea, which works on the same brain receptors as anti-anxiety drugs, or the herb valerian or aconite, which can ease the effects of acute panic attacks. That's the end of part two. Part three. You will hear part of a radio interview in which professional golfer Amy Hartman is being interviewed. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You will now have 70 seconds to look at part three. We are here today with golfing phenomenon Amy Hartman. She won countless national and international tournaments. Now, Amy, I was glancing through your website profile and noticed that you were involved in a variety of sports throughout junior high and high school. What did golf have that these other sports were lacking that pushed you to keep playing? I felt like I could become more successful with golf. I realise it more and more now that unlike track, volleyball and gymnastics, golf is a lot easier on my body as well. I will be able to play golf a lot longer than any other sport that I have ever participated in. On any given day, is there any specific food diet you try to stick to on and off the course? I always stick to my fruit smoothies in the morning. I am overall a pretty healthy person. Once in a blue moon I will have a cheeseburger and not feel guilty about it. I'm a fruits, nuts and grains kind of girl. I didn't like the health food that my parents fed me as a child, but I'm thankful now for it has just become a habit. I don't even consider cooking greasy food or having a donut for breakfast because it's never been an option for me. I'm sure you spend endless amounts of time at the driving range each week, but what do you do when you're not swinging a golf club? <laughs> Are you asking whether or not I have a social life? I admit it's hard because I do not have a lot of time. And of course, when I do have time, I'm often quite exhausted. This may make me sound really pathetic, but I spend a lot of time with my cat at home, actually. He's a little goofy. He's constantly at my feet when I'm at home, especially when I have been gone for a few weeks. I also watch a lot of movies and spend time catching up with my friends. I always keep myself busy somehow, whether it's any of the above or working out at the gym, reading a book or working on some art piece that I always promised myself that I would finish. I can't remember the last time I was bored. Your website, Amy Golf, has grown in huge popularity in the golf blog community in only the few months it's been around. What do you contribute the success of your site to? I didn't realise this at first, but many golf fans want to get more insight into the life of touring professionally beyond the scoreboard or a random article on some random website. So simply, the fact that I frequently updated my blog or shared what I have on my iPod or photographs from my life got me a big following. And now it's almost viral. I got more interviews that get me more fans, and more bloggers have rolled my site as a result of the fresh content and updates. I always thank a lot of people on my site because my site's success is as much mine as it is theirs.
There are plenty of superstitious people in the world. Do you have any superstitions, such as an item you must have with you when you're playing? If so, how did you come by it? You may believe me or not, but I've absolutely no superstitions. I've been asked the same question several times and still have not been able to come up with an answer. I have a favourite shirt that I like to wear during big tournaments, but I'm not superstitious about it at all. I simply like it. Sorry if that's a disappointing answer. With turning only 26 in May, are there any other goals or plans you'd like to accomplish in your lifetime? Well, although I am only 26 years old, I am one of the oldest girls out there on the Futures Tour. A lot of girls have three or four years more experience in competition than me. So for right now, I'm very dedicated to the goals that I've set for myself on tour and to making it to the LPGA Tour. I don't like to plan too far ahead in life. I just take it one step at a time. Now you'll hear part three again. We are here today with golfing phenomenon Amy Hartman. She won countless national and international tournaments. Now, Amy, I was glancing through your website profile and noticed that you were involved in a variety of sports throughout junior high and high school. What did golf have that these other sports were lacking that pushed you to keep playing? I felt like I could become more successful with golf. I realise it more and more now that unlike track, volleyball and gymnastics, golf is a lot easier on my body as well. I will be able to play golf a lot longer than any other sport that I have ever participated in. On any given day, is there any specific food diet you try to stick to on and off the course? I always stick to my fruit smoothies in the morning. I am overall a pretty healthy person. Once in a blue moon I will have a cheeseburger and not feel guilty about it. I am a fruits, nuts and grains kind of girl. I didn't like the health food that my parents fed me as a child. But I'm thankful now for it has just become a habit. I don't even consider cooking greasy food or having a donut for breakfast because it's never been an option for me. I'm sure you spend endless amounts of time at the driving range each week, but what do you do when you're not swinging a golf club? <laughs> Are you asking whether or not I have a social life? I admit it's hard because I do not have a lot of time. And of course, when I do have time, I'm often quite exhausted. This may make me sound really pathetic, but I spend a lot of time with my cat at home, actually. He's a little goofy. He's constantly at my feet when I'm at home, especially when I have been gone for a few weeks. I also watch a lot of movies and spend time catching up with my friends. I always keep myself busy somehow, whether it's any of the above or working out at the gym, reading a book or working on some art piece that I always promised myself that I would finish. I can't remember the last time I was bored. Your website, Amy Golf, has grown in huge popularity in the golf blog community in only the few months it's been around. What do you contribute the success of your site to? I didn't realise this at first, but many golf fans want to get more insight into the life of touring professionally beyond the scoreboard or a random article on some random website. So simply, the fact that I frequently updated my blog or shared what I have on my iPod or photographs from my life got me a big following. And now it's almost viral. I got more interviews that get me more fans. And more bloggers have rolled my site as a result of the fresh content and updates. I always thank a lot of people on my site because my site's success is as much mine as it is theirs. There are plenty of superstitious people in the world. Do you have any superstitions, such as an item you must have with you when you're playing? If so, how did you come by it? You may believe me or not but I've absolutely no superstitions. I've been asked the same question several times and still have not been able to come up with an answer. I have a favourite shirt that I like to wear during big tournaments, but I'm not superstitious about it at all. I simply like it. Sorry if that's a disappointing answer. With turning only 26 in May, are there any other goals or plans you'd like to accomplish in your lifetime? Well, although I am only 26 years old, I am one of the oldest girls out there on the Futures Tour. A lot of girls have three or four years more experience in competition than me. So for right now, I'm very dedicated to the goals that I've set for myself on tour and to making it to the LPGA Tour. I don't like to plan too far ahead in life. I just take it one step at a time. That's the end of part three. 
Part 4. Part 4 consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their jobs in transport. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You will now have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1 I like it best when uh, people I pick up like to talk and, and know how to hold a conversation. I know a lot of people in my line of work prefer just to take people from point A to point B without the needless chit-chat, but I get too bored if it wasn't for the social aspect of this job. I especially love tourists. I'm definitely rare in that regard. But I love pointing out parts of the city that I think they should visit or warning them to avoid certain tourist traps. I love hearing people's stories, learning what brought them here, where they come from, etc. Certainly, many people prefer to simply tell me their destination and then sit in silence or doodle on their Blackberry until we arrive. Of course, I should respect that, but that's not always easy to do. That's probably one of my faults. I don't know when I should just be quiet and I end up annoying people. Of course, I like to believe that most people truly love listening to me. And perhaps this is unethical. But if I meet someone whose company I find particularly enjoyable, I'll lower their fare. Speaker 2 Sometimes it's hard working with such wealthy people on a daily basis. I admit it, I overhear their conversations about their country clubs, their fancy cars or their mansions, and I definitely get jealous. It's not that I'm poor by any means. I live a comfortable life and we're not in need of anything. But when I work, it's like I'm entering an entirely different world than the world that I live in. Despite this being my job, when my family flies, we sit economy class. Like most people, we get our elbows hit by the drink cart and complain of the lack of legroom. But the people I fly around not only do not have to worry about the other passengers bothering them, they also have beds and champagne on board with them. It's really quite a life. They treat me well, though. When I do overnight flights, they usually arrange for me to stay at a pretty fancy hotel, so I get to experience how the other half lives. Speaker 3 I absolutely love my job. These children light up my life and give me something to smile about every day. Of course, they also can tire me out. Many of them are too energetic to sit in their seats their entire route. Moreover, as it is natural with young children, there are always some older children picking on the younger ones. That is the biggest challenge of the job, because I can't discipline like a teacher would be able to. I need to keep my hands on the wheel and my eyes on the road. Luckily, I have earned enough respect that many of them listen to me when I holler at them to sit down and behave. To help me out, I have asked one of my older students to be on patrol. I think she likes the responsibility. I gave her a badge that she wears as she walks up and down the aisle telling people to sit down or not to yell. It's actually quite amazing how well the other students respond to her. She's the first one I pick up in the morning and the last off on the way home in the afternoon. After all the other students get off in the afternoon, I give her a handful of candy. She considers it her salary. Speaker 4 I mostly just take couples around. People see my ride as something extracted from a fairy tale. Like it's the way a prince and a princess ride off together to live happily ever after. Now, of course, having been doing this for nearly 20 years, I certainly have a different take on it. The horses are usually the ones breaking the romantic ideal for the couple. 
mostly because they really do not carry the most pleasant aroma. <laughs> uh, let's just say it's not always just pure romance in the air. I still remember one time when a man was proposing to his girlfriend and he had to stop in the middle of his beautiful romantic overture because he kept gagging from the horrible stench coming a few feet in front of him. It was quite funny, actually. Uh, but I do admit I am lucky to bear witness to so many proposals or anniversaries or just people in love celebrating for no other reason except for that. And I enjoy the ride, too. We pass through some amazing scenery that even after all this time, I'm still not tired of looking at it. It's all quite enchanting. Speaker 5 People think that I mostly drive wealthy people around, but that is not the case. You'd be surprised how many people just want to take a night to spoil themselves and in a way pretend to be rich for a night. My main jobs are weddings and high school dances. It's especially entertaining when there are teenagers in the vehicle because they are so fascinated by everything. The phone is usually the favorite, which is annoying from my point of view. They think it is just so funny that they can call me from the back seat. I love driving. I admit it. I do feel a little powerful driving such a large vehicle on the road. It's amazing how many people will get out of my way. Of course, parallel parking is out of the question. You do have to drive it very carefully, though, and always check your mirrors. Because it is so long, there are more blind spots than in a normal-sized car. I had to get a special license to drive it. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I like it best when the people I pick up like to talk and, and know how to hold a conversation. I know a lot of people in my line of work prefer just to take people from point A to point B without the needless chit-chat. But I get too bored if it wasn't for the social aspect of this job. I especially love tourists. I'm definitely rare in that regard. But I love pointing out parts of the city that I think they should visit, or warning them to avoid certain tourist traps. I love hearing people's stories, learning what brought them here, where they come from, etc. Certainly, many people prefer to simply tell me their destination and then sit in silence or doodle on their Blackberry until we arrive. Of course, I should respect that, but that's not always easy to do. That's probably one of my faults. I don't know when I should just be quiet and I end up annoying people. Of course, I like to believe that most people truly love listening to me. And perhaps this is unethical, but if I meet someone whose company I find particularly enjoyable, I'll lower their fare. Speaker 2 Sometimes it's hard working with such wealthy people on a daily basis. I admit it, I overhear their conversations about their country clubs, their fancy cars or their mansions, and I definitely get jealous. It's not that I'm poor by any means. I live a comfortable life and we're not in need of anything. But when I work, it's like I'm entering an entirely different world than the world that I live in. Despite this being my job, when my family flies, we sit economy class. Like most people, we get our elbows hit by the drink cart and complain of the lack of legroom. But the people I fly around not only do not have to worry about the other passengers bothering them, they also have beds and champagne on board with them. It's really quite a life. They treat me well, though. When I do overnight flights, they usually arrange for me to stay at a pretty fancy hotel, so I get to experience how the other half lives. Speaker 3 I absolutely love my job. These children light up my life and give me something to smile about every day. Of course, they also can tire me out. Many of them are too energetic to sit in their seats their entire route. Moreover, as it is natural with young children, there are always some older children picking on the younger ones. That is the biggest challenge of the job, because I can't discipline like a teacher would be able to. I need to keep my hands on the wheel and my eyes on the road. Luckily, I have earned enough respect that many of them listen to me when I holler at them to sit down and behave. To help me out, I have asked one of my older students to be on patrol. I think she likes the responsibility. I gave her a badge that she wears as she walks up and down the aisle telling people to sit down or not to yell. It's actually quite amazing how well the other students respond to her. 
She's the first one I pick up in the morning and the last off on the way home in the afternoon. After all the other students get off in the afternoon, I give her a handful of candy. She considers it her salary. Speaker 4 I mostly just take couples around. People see my ride as something extracted from a fairy tale. Like it's the way a prince and a princess ride off together to live happily ever after. Now, of course, having been doing this for nearly 20 years, I certainly have a different take on it. The horses are usually the ones breaking the romantic ideal for the couple. Mostly because they really do not carry the most pleasant aroma. <laughs> uh, let's just say it's not always just pure romance in the air. I still remember one time when a man was proposing to his girlfriend and he had to stop in the middle of his beautiful romantic overture because he kept gagging from the horrible stench coming a few feet in front of him. It was quite funny, actually. But I do admit I am lucky to bear witness to so many proposals or anniversaries or just people in love celebrating for no other reason except for that. And I enjoy the ride, too. We pass through some amazing scenery that even after all this time, I'm still not tired of looking at it. It's all quite enchanting. Speaker 5 People think that I mostly drive wealthy people around, but that is not the case. You'd be surprised how many people just want to take a night to spoil themselves and in a way pretend to be rich for a night. My main jobs are weddings and high school dances. It's especially entertaining when there are teenagers in the vehicle because they are so fascinated by everything. The phone is usually the favorite, which is annoying from my point of view. They think it is just so funny that they can call me from the back seat. I love driving. I admit it. I do feel a little powerful driving such a large vehicle on the road. It's amazing how many people will get out of my way. Of course, parallel parking is out of the question. You do have to drive it very carefully, though, and always check your mirrors. Because it is so long, there are more blind spots than in a normal-sized car. I had to get a special license to drive it. That's the end of Part 4. And that's that. Congratulations. You have finished the listening test. How did it go? Well, pause the video and check your answers. And please do pay attention to part two because spelling matters. If you have the right answer but the wrong spelling, then you do not get the point. Okay, so check your answers and calculate your final score and then let's take a look at what that means. So how does your final score compare to this grading scheme? Did you get a B2, a C1, or a C2 pass? Now, if you got a B2 or a low C1, that probably means you need to do some extra work to get exam ready. Now, home studies can help you with this. You can either enroll in the e-learning course, which is all online, or you can have one-to-one -one lessons with one of our experienced exam trainers. So if you would like help in preparing for the exam, feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Well, that's going to do it. I hope this listening test has given you a good idea of what to expect in the exam and also how you do on different tasks, maybe where your strengths and weaknesses are and where you could use extra help. If you need extra help, then please get in touch with Home Studies. We specialize in exam preparation so we can help to get you there. So have a wonderful rest of your day and I do hope I'll be seeing you in the next video.